Hello, everyone. My name is Saad Ali. I'm a software engineer here at Google, and I'm very lucky to be joined by Kelsey Hightower, the greatest person that I know. Oh, I'm putting on that my performance review. That's right. Kelsey, can you tell us uh, what you're most excited about at KubeCon here this, uh, this year? You've been to a lot of KubeCons. Yeah, uh, we have 8,000 people here. And what I'm noticing is some people still don't know what Kubernetes is. So keeping that fresh perspective, I can learn how we should be making it better what the real problems are, right? You know, I haven't had to manage production infrastructure in a few years now. So it's kind of nice to know like what the real problems are, keeping grounded, and just learning from other people, right? So a lot of us consider us experts, right? You're expert in the storage space. But then there's things, use cases we don't know. So the opportunity to learn from the community. Yeah. So, I mean, I've heard a lot from you about customer empathy. Uh, not necessarily worrying about the engineering problem, but taking time to think about what do uh, what are the problems that we're actually solving for customers and in that perspective you know you've been asking us to take a step back from kubernetes and look at the problem more holistically uh, can you talk about that and what google's been doing in the past few quarters to actually address that yeah so i think the kubernetes team in particular or any team that's building doing engineering work in the open you start to have empathy for all the issues that get opened right but for me i get the i get fortunate that i get to go see our customers and whiteboard and very rarely do we start with Kubernetes as the solution or the problem. It's usually we want to do these five or six things. So internally, you've been a part of them. We do these empathy sessions. And the goal is to take our engineering and say, let's feel it the way our customers feel it. And then we actually start to see that, you know what, without even mentioning Kubernetes, we all have ideas of how to solve these problems. It's bonus points that we can leverage a platform like Kubernetes to solve them. So I think it's more of how can we make more people successful? Sometimes that involves Kubernetes or sometimes that involves a new thing like Istio to solve that kind of problems. So that empathy session is what helps me stay grounded and focused on what the customer needs. So as you talk to customers now, what are the problems that you're seeing them encounter that uh, we really need to address as a community now? Honestly, I think it's the principles, right? CICD has been a good idea for a long time. It isn't just a good idea because Kubernetes has came out. So what I try to ask them is this, what is your culture? What is your change management process? That's what you're going to build into this concept called CICD. It's not about Spinnaker versus Jenkins. Pick one. Once you pick one, you're going to articulate your culture in that. I tell people you're going to write a set of bash scripts in a specific order, and that's how you're going to do things. If you're using raw VMs, that will still work. When Kubernetes comes in, you can eliminate a lot of stuff that you do in between CI and Kubernetes, and then that's the business thing that you focus on. But then the platform stays the same. Whether you're using cloud functions, um, Kubernetes or raw VMs, most developers can just check in code and you hide that complexity. That to me is the principle that has never changed. I'm telling companies now, you need to get that done. Do not kick that can down the road. Yes, Kubernetes is awesome, has a lot of great technologies, but if we just go out and hand out kubectl to everyone, we're kind of regressing back to the old ways of doing things. Put CICD on top, and just enjoy the fact that you're going to have to do a lot less glue between CICD and Kubernetes. So that's great advice uh, for uh, developers or companies to start focusing on CICD first and let everything else evolve from there. Um, do you have any other advice for customers, especially those with uh, a lot of legacy applications and how they should deal with them and you know, think about this modern world? You know, it's funny. Every customer I meet and they say legacy, I'm so you're not allowed to say legacy. You have to say classic because it's the legacy stuff that's paying your paycheck, right? Like, that's where it comes from. This is the tried and true. So if you consider it a classic An thing, antique. then you kind of appreciate it a little bit better. So what I tell them is, a lot of the things that are working will probably also work in the new world. It's just about where do you adapt, right? So in my keynote, it's funny, I'm going to be using Fortran, right? This is one of the original programming languages, recently had a release in 2018, and I'll be using that to deploy to Kubernetes and other serverless platforms just to show people it's not about legacy versus new things. It's more about we've learned things in the last 30 years. A lot of them are baked into tools like Kubernetes. And here's how you leverage them with some of your existing stuff. Sometimes that's a rewrite. Sometimes it's a retrofit. So I want people to focus more on the principles. Those last forever, even if the product changes. And do they need to? Do they need to modernize at all? Or is that an option then to stay put where they are? So when I think about modernization, if you have an app that you neglect it, you've not updated it, you haven't patched it, you're using outdated software that hasn't any more support, you're vulnerable. There's security reasons why you need to update that. It's not even about modernization. You need to stay on top of it. So software is a liability. Once you write some software, it's yours. And you got to nurture and feed it. 
So whether you decide to leapfrog and say, you know what, if we're going to make adjustments to this to improve security posture, maybe we adapt containers and that gets us there a little bit quicker. So to me, the modernization is more about there are new things available that were not available before and how are we going to leverage them? And then label that whatever you want. But to me, you still need to do that regardless for security, um, just so you know how it works. But yeah, leverage some of the new stuff. That makes sense. So security is a very, very good reason to not stay put because you will become a target very quickly. Uh, yes. Okay, that makes sense. So looking uh, forward into 2019, what are you most excited about? I think 2019 we're starting to settle. I've been looking at the Kubernetes release notes. Not a lot of big bang new features. So we're starting to stabilize. And as we stabilize, in 2019 I think we have more people saying the same things. Everyone knows what a container is. You know what a pod is. We kind of are starting to understand networking. But we're also starting to understand where the value line is. This is where Kubernetes stops. This is where Istio takes over. Here's where CICD plays. Here's where serverless starts. Like native has given people kind of this clear line of starting to think about this functions as a service kind of thing. So I think 2019, we're going to start to now get a return on value from this big open source investment, right? You've been working on Kubernetes forever. I've been involved for a very long time. And when you start to look at it, it's like, when do we start getting the payback on this? So now people using GKE, they don't even think about it. Oh, there's a security vulnerability. Click, we've upgraded it for them. So now we're starting to see return on investment in 2019, and now we're going to also start to identify what's missing, right? We know what we can do in Kubernetes to improve, but there's a whole layer between just run my code and what Kubernetes does, that's 2019. That sounds wonderful. Uh, so just to wrap things up, let's talk about KubeCon. Uh, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. What's your favorite KubeCon memory of all the KubeCons that you've been to? You know what, the very first KubeCon was purely community. There was no CNCF yet. There was no big sponsors This was in San Francisco. Yet. Yeah, it was just a bunch of people that got in one spot, and we were all betting. It wasn't the number one platform. We were still like, is Docker Swarm the way to go? Is Mesos the way to go? So we got in that room and we said, hey, here's what we're doing. Here's how we're trying it. And I remember, I think Michelle Norali posted the Twitter thing. How many people are running Kubernetes on production? And we had them all get on the stage, <laughs> right? And all of them can probably fit right here if we try to. And that was a very authentic conference, right? It's like everyone, you had to buy in. And now when you zoom forward, you can kind of see those people are still here. Mm -hmm. So we knew that we built a very strong community in the very beginning, and that's why I can never forget that. Mm. That's, I think, one of the big reasons that Kubernetes is, uh, the scale that it is now is because of the community that it nurtured and uh, the leaderships that came from the bottom up, basically. And I think you played a large part of that. Thank you, Kelsey. Awesome, thank you. All right, take care. Bye.